Good morning. I'm Tim O'Malley, CEO of Atima Media and Marketing. Welcome to the 20th Annual Hospitality and Tourism Summit and such an important panel entitled How to Keep Our Guests and Employees Safe, brought to you by Navy Pier. We're filming at the AV Chicago studio at Chop Shop. It's a state-of-the-art facility in Wicker Park. We are so grateful to film our hybrid educational sessions in this amazing studio. Cheers to AV Chicago for being our hybrid production sponsor, and a big shout out to Andrew, Justin, Amanda, and their entire team. We consider ourselves very fortunate to have some of the best in the business as partners. We couldn't produce this event without them. I'd like to thank our premier sponsors, Navy Pier, Skydeck Chicago, Fashion Outlets of Chicago, the shops at Northbridge, and Old Post Office. I'd like to thank our supporting sponsors, Live Art International, Safe Expo, and Salvi Media. I'd also like to thank our participating sponsors, Choose Chicago, National Concierge Association, Chicago Hotel Concierge Association, Spectra, Levy, Show Services, NHS, Balloons by Tommy, FedEx, Accurate Printing, Quest Events, and Expo. It takes a lot of partners to put this event together. Navy Pier has been a phenomenal host and partner of the hospitality and tourism for 20 years. Marilyn and her team have always done a great job, but they've really outdone themselves this year and, and, and in the last couple of years in terms of updating their offerings. And I'd like to share a great video that they sent. At Spectre Venue Management, our priority is the safety and health of our employees, partners, clients, and guests. As a GBAC STAR accredited facility, our center has implemented the most stringent protocols for cleaning, disinfection, and infectious disease prevention. I'm Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner. I'm the director of the Global Bio-Risk Advisory Council, known as GBAC, which is a division of ISSA. The process of GBAC STAR accreditation it's a performance-based system to develop protocols, procedures, standard operating procedures that are evidence-based and actually function. And we can tell people what we're doing, why we're doing it, and that this is a safe event in a safe building because of the way that we have identified risk and the solutions we've come up to mitigate that risk. GBAC developed comprehensive protocols and procedures for cleaning and disinfection. By implementing GBAC procedures at your venues, you create a sense of security and trust by assuring your attendees, your guests, and stakeholders that this is a very safe and healthy environment. Spectra is dedicated to continuing to lead the way in the future of events through our cutting edge innovations and comprehensive procedures. We are innovators, we are pioneers, we are Spectra. Okay, that was a great video and all, but I cannot wait to be in person at Navy Pier for the 20th Annual Hospitality and Tourism Summit Trade Show on June 8th. We're all so excited to get back to the pier and get our industry back together, and we're going to do it safely. It's so important that we take this step together as an industry to show people that it's safe to visit Chicago and produce meeting and events here. It's time. Together we can lead our industry back towards normalcy. Please, spread the word, let's show our strength. And it's going to be an outstanding day. We'll have over 75 exhibitors and 800 people, including the who's who of influencers in our industry. You'll see meeting and event planners, hotel concierge, guest services and salespeople, DMCs, social media influencers, industry leaders and more. Not to mention some of Chicago's top tourism, group, and private event-oriented organizations. You'll also be able to sample some fantastic food and drinks. In addition to the virtual education sessions, there are four other new items I'd like to share. First, the event will be held at the Aon Grand Ballroom in Navy Pier and in four adjacent spaces for a total potential capacity of over 13,000 people. Since we're expecting only 800 attendees, you don't have to be a math genius to figure out that there will be plenty of, of space for social distance. Second, there will be strict COVID-19 safety measures. Our new event space has received a GBAC STAR accreditation from the Global, Risk, Global Bio Risk Advisory Council, and we've partnered with Safe Expo to create and execute our overall safety plan. 
Rest assured that the grand ballroom, uh, everyone there will be masked up, there will be temperature checks, and we'll do everything we need to make sure that you're safe. Third, we'll be offering tours of Navy Pier. If you haven't seen their new offerings for events and visitors, you don't want to miss this. Finally, we'll be producing an entertainment showcase this year brought to you by Live Art International. If you're looking to find entertainers to book, or if you're like me and you just can't wait to see live entertainment, you need to come to see this. You'll see one of Chicago's hottest bands, amazing magical performances, and a variety of Chicago's greatest talents from blues to pop to classical. I personally can't wait for this one. It's just so important that we take this step together as an industry to show people that it's safe to get together again. It's time. That being said, I'm hoping you can help us. Due to furloughs and massive change in our industry, it's not as easy as it once was to connect and contact folks that should be with us at the trade show on June 8th. Can you please make a point to pass the word to one person who should be there, who should be there with us? This is the perfect opportunity to show people that Chicago is ready to host visitors and events again, and it would be great to show the strength of our industry. You can get more information on our website at hts.events or on Facebook and LinkedIn. Thank you. Okay, let's get on with the reason we're here. We've got a phenomenal panel for you entitled, How to Keep Our Guests and Employees Safe. I have the honor of introducing our moderator, Matt Laws, President and CEO of Safe Expo. Matt's the founder of MGL Management LLC, a service event company. Since 2004, the company has provided solutions to the military, agriculture, and medical industries and their events. When the events industry hit pause due to the worldwide pandemic, Matt and other industry experts formed Safe Expo LLC to help live events return safely. With 20 plus years of events experience, Matt has assisted with events ranging from 500 to 37,000 participants. Be it new technology or health safety services, Matt looks forward to helping the industry address and adapt to the new live event landscape. Please welcome Matt Laws. Hey Tim, thanks so much for that introduction. My name is Matt Laws and I'm the president and CEO of Safe Expo. We're actually almost one year old today and it was back in May of 2020 where Safe Expo was born um, due to the pandemic and all of the uh, pause that we saw for the events. Um, I'm proud to be here with um, Amy from SLAS. I'm gonna let her give a little bit of her background. Uh, so Amy, go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Amy Wilkinson and I am the Director of Global Events for the Society for Laboratory Automation and Screening. We present approximately six events per year, both here in the United States and abroad. Um, so we're very excited to see our industry reopening. Thank you, Amy. And now we're going to go to Dave from Spectra. Go ahead, Dave. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Anderson. I am General Manager of the Palm Beach County Convention Center in West Palm Beach, Florida. I'm also a Regional Vice President of Spectra Venue Management. So I oversee buildings in Dallas, Santa Clara, California, Niagara Falls, Richmond, Miami Beach, and of course, uh, Navy Pier. Thanks, Dave. So on a national level, since Spectra has how many venues across the country, um, what market would you say you've been in, attracting in terms of your meetings and business is coming back? Yeah, thanks. It's a good question. Um, you know, some of our buildings actually did not uh, really see a, a, a downtick, uh, even with the pandemic, but uh, in the middle of America. So uh, St. Charles, Missouri, Overland Park, Kansas, some of these buildings continue to do events uh, even during the pandemic. But uh, where we're really seeing an uptick is uh, uh, facilities like uh, Des Moines, Iowa. We run the convention center arena there and uh, the buildings literally are operating at 100%. Uh, they, the clients are coming back extremely fast, both on the ticketed event side and on the meetings and convention side. And then we're just opening up our big boxes, we call them, so Miami Beach Convention Center, uh, Dallas Convention Center in Dallas, Cincinnati Convention Center, and then soon to be uh, Navy Pier will be opening back up June. But we're seeing an uptick in business. We finally got these large buildings open and we're starting to see events come back. So uh, the good news is just about everybody is online. And then we still have about three or four buildings that are actually doing vaccines uh, for the public, which is a great story. 
Uh, we've got a couple of buildings that probably have done over 100,000 vaccines out of the facilities themselves. So they'll probably continue for another month or two and then they'll come back online. That's great. Now, from the planner standpoint, are you seeing any hesitancy uh, for them to sign contracts? Um, are you adapting your terms and conditions in terms of allowing them to be um, a little bit more flexible um, to change dates, to move, you know, different things around and then cancellations? What are you seeing there? Yeah, I think you hit it on the head with the word flexibility. Uh, when uh, the pandemic struck, I think we were all a little bit in shock for that first 30 days and then everything started to kick in as it relates to clients making some hard decisions. And uh, I know as myself as a general manager and us as a company, we really took a client first approach uh, to the clients, uh, both locally and nationally. Um, a lot of clients needed to make some very fast decisions, uh, either with canceling their event or moving their event. And we really always cited on the side of the client uh, to try to take care of them in this unprecedented situation. Um, you know, right now I, we're seeing an uptick um, in client. Uh, one of the things is site tours. Uh, I, I have never seen more site tours, you know, probably in the past year than in the last two weeks, uh, both at my facility and across the country. Uh, so it's telling me that clients are actually coming out. Uh, business in, um, you know, 23 and beyond is still pretty consistent, uh, but we're starting to see clients dip their toes into the water about doing fall 21 and 22 and actually group business that actually would bring a room night component with it. Uh, so it's, it's nice to see, uh, you know, there's still some apprehension, uh, but it's really more with the clients that have not done their first event yet. Uh, but the ones that have gotten over the hump and done one event, it's, it's really, made it a lot easier for them because they they know we can do it in a safe environment. Yeah, that's great. You know, we're seeing a lot of, uh, I think, more events coming back online for Q3 and Q4. So you're right. I think the fall is going to be extremely busy. It was, our, it was already busy in normal times, but with people moving dates, changing, trying to push them back, I think we're going to, you know, see a very busy uh, trade show schedule. Um, so relating to that, in terms of the food and beverage, um, I'm going to ask both of you guys, what are you seeing there with how that has changed and what um, is being done to make it safer with these new COVID restrictions? I'm going to go to Amy first. Um, I have not executed an event yet um, in the post-COVID era, but we've seen a lot uh, or heard a lot, I suppose, and Dave's going to have a lot of great insights to this um, from an execution perspective um, about the buffet, the buffet going the way of, you know, no longer. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think we will see a return of the buffet and we can look, you know, no farther than our restaurant and grocery colleagues in the industry to see what they've done. Um, to make buffets work. I think that um, from an affordability standpoint and from a waste standpoint, the buffet is really still the way to serve big, large groups of people. Um, but we'll probably see attendance at the buffet. We'll probably see the glove machines at the buffet. Things, things will be a little bit different. Um, from That's what I'm thinking anyway. Um, and I, you know, box lunches. We've been feeding, it, convention centers like Dave's have been feeding upwards of 30, 50,000 people with box lunches for years and years and years. And that still feels like, um, it still feels like a pretty safe way to go. So. Yeah, Dave, and for you, is it universal? Obviously, I think state, states may be different, um, but what are you seeing within your spectra uh, facilities? Yeah, I think, I think Amy hit it on the head. Um, but one of the things I, I guess I'll, I'll make a comment on, and it probably, I don't know if it'll come out right, but I, I think there's a, a certain level of service that has actually gotten better on the food side uh, with the pandemic, because we've kind of brought back the personal service, not that we weren't doing it, but uh, it's it's a requirement now. So uh, to Amy's point, I, you know, like the word buffet probably will get ditched, or at least I'd like it to, uh, but, but from a serving standpoint, we've already executed a ton of events where, uh, where, where the, the, uh, the, the serving, uh, the services are, it's almost kind of like made to order. So, um, you know, somebody may be in a line, uh, but they're actually being served fresh foods and it's made to order. So it's, uh, there's, it's kind of a buffet. 
uh, but the the feel and the freshness of the food in in the uh, as as Amy put it, you know, the safety features as it relates to masks, gloves, uh, you know, sneeze guards, the protection. Again, they've always been there, but this is to a heightened level. Um, but I, what I've been impressed with across the board is uh, is convention center catering operations has has have made it really they've made it interesting and fun. And they've made the displays extremely appealing. So uh, the PCMA event you were talking about that we hosted uh, in West Palm Beach, you know, when we broke and we had everybody come out into the pre-function area, it was literally like kind of a line and they were getting a box lunch, but, but it was probably the nicest box lunch I've ever seen. And they were going down the line, they were picking all the ingredients and everything to go into the box and it was fresh tenderloin sandwiches with whatever they wanted on it and they got to pick their desserts and then it was boxed in a box lunch really nicely done and they could take it to a safe place outside on the patio and eat so i think uh that that is something that um is going to uh it, some of it's going to stay well beyond the pandemic and and i think the other thing real quick is prepackaged meals and and foods and even breaks uh, i've been amazed at how well uh, operations have done with prepackaged. So, you know, a meeting will break out for 20 or 30. Typically, there's just big, um, you know, big canisters of M&Ms or something else. Well, now this is all prepackaged, but it's it's really well done. So you come out, you safe, you grab one of the packages. It might have pretzels, M&Ms, you know, peanuts, other things that are that are put in there. And the client can come back and they can sit at their table or at their desk and they can have their break and they can feel safe, you know, versus everybody just going into one big bin. So um, I think the, the food divisions uh, across America have done a tremendous job and I think a lot of it is going to stick. I wanted to just add, as Dave was talking, something that I was thinking about is as, as event planners, I think we really need to remember that our venue partners have been doing this. For, the, for this entire pandemic. This reopening is not new to you, it's new to us as event planners. Um, so even places like the San Diego Convention Center has been a shelter. They've been feeding thousands of people a day for over a year. And you know, Dave was saying most of his facilities are open. So I think we need to put our trust and collaboration in, um, in our venue partners for sure going forward. Yeah, and I think, Dave, you had a good point in terms of what kind of packaging can make it fun for the attendee, so it's good to know. We just did a site visit actually yesterday, and we're doing more and more site visits, um, as you said. So, And some of the events that we've done over the past you know, two or three months, um, those buffets are certainly um, staffed. Um, a lot of groups are looking to do outdoor meals if it's uh, you know, able to be done that way so every event venue i think is different in terms of of how they handle that um, so let's go to a question for amy i think you know both you and i know that when it comes to planning for a safe meeting or an event or any sort of social gathering one of the first things to do is you know you have to select the right venue um, and it has to meet your needs what would you say are the top three things that you're looking for when it comes to selecting a venue in post-COVID era? Um, I think, you know, a little bit um, going back to what Dave was talking about, what you and Dave were talking about earlier, is flexible terms and conditions and flexible contracts. Um, we, we, I think we have seen over the last year that our industry might not have been set up um, to protect itself um, with, with the way that our contracts were written. So I think that's got to be the, the, at the top of my list, certainly. Um, and in a fair way, not just in a one-sided way for the client or in a one-sided way for the venue. It needs to be you know, as, as flexible as we can. I think we were doing a lot of reacting and trying to do rebookings and, and find ways to, to mitigate cancellations, and rightfully so. It was a very chaotic time, but going forward, um, I, I really think that'll be the, the key thing is to have flexibility in those contracts. Um, internet <laughs> is going to be absolutely on my list going forward. The hybrid event model is here for a little while, for sure. 
Um, internet is already a huge expense for event organizers. Um, it's some, it, and it's a non-negotiable expense. We have to provide it to our attendees um, and to our stakeholders as they're coming in. So making sure that it's affordable and reliable and available to everybody is going to be absolutely critical. Um, and then the third thing I think I would say is, is really probably documented safety procedures. And, and as event organizers, we will certainly be working with, um, with companies like Safe Expo to make sure that we have a safety plan that is in place for our event. But we are going to need to consult with our venue partners to make sure that they have a safety plan that's in place for their facility um, and eliminate all of those gray areas, all of those, those areas that we, you know, we, 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 we don't want to be in an issue where we don't know how to enforce something or we don't know how to communicate something. So having documented safety procedures at the time of contracting and knowing that that communication has already happened at the venue and government level is, is definitely critical. Yeah, and as a, as a planner, are you worried about any of the implications um, that the new policies or restrictions have had on the overall attendee experience? Um, and what are you doing to combat that, to try to get people to feel comfortable to come back to live meetings and events? I would love to say no, um, but I think I would be blowing smoke, um, <laughs> for sure. Uh, I, I honestly think that these... Um, the, the, the protocols that we are going to be putting in place at the event level, the social distancing, the masking, potentially vaccination and, and testing, attestation, things of that nature, I don't think those are going to be a huge deterrent to our attendees. Of course, it's going to be at a different, it's going to be a different on-site experience. And, and you know, Safe Expo has, is implementing a lot of those programs as it stands now. Where I think we as event organizers need to be realistic is with, with the broader reach of, of these types of things, travel restrictions, um, and not just travel restrictions, state to state, airline to airline, so on and so forth, but company travel restrictions, corporate, yeah. corporate travel restrictions. Um, a lot of times at, 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 at association and society events, these are professional development events, and these are not people that are footing the bill for their own registration, so they're going um, and representing their, their corporation or their company at this event. Um, so company rest travel restrictions and then, of course, um, return to school is going to be a, a huge thing. If somebody doesn't have child care for their, for their kids, that means they probably can't travel to an event for a week. So um, I think it, we really have to know the demographic of our groups that are coming in um, and communicate what that demographic is to all of our partners um, appropriately so that everybody sort of has the right expectation. Yeah, and Dave, when you look at the registration process you know at your venues which is going to change based on you know venue to venue what are you guys doing or, or what do you feel is going to be the most important thing to focus on for let's say the registration area or those most congested areas um, session rooms and general sessions and large you know ballroom events um, in terms of keeping that part of it safe um, for you know everyone that's involved yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you that, uh, uh, and I've said this uh, many times lately, is uh, the, probably the one thing that, that's come out of the pandemic that, uh, that I've actually been pleased with, and it's probably the only thing, is the collaboration uh, that has actually happened in our industry. And uh, not only, um, you know, uh, venues like within our company, uh, but I'm talking our competitors, uh, planners, uh, companies like yours. Um, I've never seen a, a, as much sharing of information and collaboration to try to make things work as I have in the last 12 months. And my hope is that that continues uh, when we when we get fully back. Um, so the registration thing is a good example of collaboration is, um, you know, the planning process for events now, uh, and Amy knows this, you know, well, because she does it for a living. But, you know, in the pandemic world, um, it, it is it's crazy. And um, I, I, uh, I, I've questioned a couple of times because we've been open since last August here in West Palm Beach. You know, I've questioned a couple of times whether it was worth it or not, um, because the scrutiny that we've been under to, to perform under a pandemic and do things right is, has been incredibly difficult team. Um, but we want to be open because we have clients that want to do events and we want staff that want to work. 
And so we, we started October 1st once we were cleared by the county here. And, and uh, so I think, you know, we, we put forth a commitment right away and so did our clients. So when we're planning and talking about registration, you know, we're looking at everything. I mean, right now, a lot of companies and a lot of groups are looking at registration like before people even arrive. So, and this is not totally new, but they're really, really pushing it. So uh, basically before even the event starts, there, there's a registration on site for checking in maybe if you need to, but most of the people are either checking in at their hotels or they're registering online while they're flying or, or driving to the location. And, it, and I liken it to the, the Marriott, you know, the first time I ever got the, uh, the Marriott, uh, what is it, the wireless key? Mobile key. Like, I didn't even know what it meant, but I was driving to a Marriott, I don't know, a year and a half ago, and they're like, uh, would you like the wireless key? And I'm like, I, I don't know. So I clicked yes. So they're like, oh, and here it is. So I got to the front desk, and they were like, well, you, you already have your key, and I didn't understand what it meant. But now, whenever I go to a Marriott, I don't even go to the front desk. Like I just walk in, I go up to my room, my, my key's right on my phone. So I've seen that with registrations now where, where it's improved the flow along with the other thing is, is clients are timing flow as well that first day when people come in if they have to do any type of on-site registration. But it's really a collaborative process between uh, my, my event managers uh, and the meeting planners and, and it's, uh, it's extremely gratifying because everybody is, uh, is, is working together, uh, you know, not only for registration, but breaks and, and those other peak times, like you mentioned, that might have a little bit of a bottleneck. You know, we, we make sure that we do everything possible to kind of loosen it up so people aren't feeling like they're in a, in a claustrophobic or unsafe place. Yeah, that's great. Amy, what about you? Have you changed your registration process and what are you looking to? Obviously, you haven't gone back yet, but when you plan um, your next live event, how is that going to work? Yep. So we, um, it, it, for our smaller events, this actually doesn't change things a lot for us. We have always sort of been um, pre-reg focused and, and digital focused in terms of our access to our small events. For our bigger events, it's going to be a challenge. We've got a lot of people typically that are, are coming through. Um, we also are thinking about move-in staff, exhibitor staff, decorator staff, um, a lot more than just our registered attendees. Um, and that's really where Safe Expo can come in and help us create a crowd management plan working with our registration and facility partners to make sure that the flow is appropriate for the space and for the number of people that we're expecting. Um, specifically to answer your question about Reg, um, we are going to do either print at home, um, completely print at home credentials, or DigiBadge. Um, we work with a registration partner called CDS, and they have a whole, a whole slew of options. Um, the one thing I would say that needs to be considered with both of those things is security. Because in, in a traditional registration environment, you are able to control that print. You are able to control that access. Um, and in a digital badge environment now with smartphones and screen captures and such, you're not able to control that as well. Um, and then with the print at home as well. There's, it's, you know, you email it to somebody and they print it and so on and so forth. So we're, there's going to be a lot of... Um, figuring out what's worth losing sleep over, really, <laughs> in that regard, but also a lot, I think, of, um, of new technologies that we're going to see, honestly, over the next year, um, the next few months, probably. Yeah, I know we've seen um, some groups that are looking to pre-print badges and mail them with a PPE kit, mm -hmm. you know, so that's one option. Um, I like the print at home, and I know some groups are looking to obviously restricted by the first time they, they check in. So once they scan in, uh, when they arrive to the venue, you know, someone else can't come behind them and use that same badge. So um, there's a lot of technology, I think, that's out there that's going to pick up, like you said, to be able to kind of um, help the process moving forward. And I would um, encourage, that. you know, the things that you mentioned and also what I was talking about and what Dave's talking about, from a planner perspective, you, you got to start those conversations early because all of that costs money, all of it. It just does. It's additional resources. Yeah. So you need to have that, those things in mind um, when you're budgeting for your event, not once you've got down in the, the planning yeah. road too far. So Yeah. So Dave, I think we just heard that uh, Navy Pier was recognized with their GBAC star. 
Um, have you seen any increase in interest um, due to that? And, and what have you kind of seen as a result from um, that certification coming through? Yeah, you know, it was, uh, it's a great question, man. It's uh, great news. Um, as a company, we, uh, we really, again, took a proactive approach uh, right away with GBAC. Uh, we've got a great relationship with them corporately. And uh, uh, the great majority of our convention centers are actually GBAC certified. Um, I, I'd like to give a shout out to Seth Kagate at Navy Pier and Sean Dewey uh, with our Spectre team. Uh, they were really the two that drove the, uh, the, the wagon to get us uh, certified there. Um, so again, we're, we're planning on coming out of the box uh, June 1st and starting to do events. Uh, but you know, the immediacy thing is it, it, is it brings confidence um, because uh, we took a real proactive approach. Now at Navy Pier, what's unique is, uh, is the entire pier was GBAC certified. So really, this isn't just the East End, which we manage. This is the entire pier, uh, which Seth and Sean worked on. So this is everything from the rides that are in the background of the, uh, the picture there uh, to the whole way that business operates at the pier. So not only the meetings, but just people coming down to the pier to do stuff. So, um, you know, I, I just keep going back to the word confidence is, uh, today, I believe, is the first day where people are actually going to start wandering the pier. And um, so I know that uh, Navy Pier has done an amazing job to prepare their team and tra train them about GBAC protocol and safety and sanita sanitization standards uh, just to make sure people feel comfortable. Because the first time people come out, you know, they're just a little leery. And I think the team has done a tremendous job. So and replicating that on June 1st when we start opening up for events on the East End is, uh, you know, the, the standards have always been high, uh, but they'll be extremely high as it relates to the safety and sanitization of the building for, for all of our attendees and clients that are in the building. Yeah, that's great. I, you know, Tim had picked a really good date because as of June 8th, you know, Hospitality Tourism Summit is going to be at Navy Pier. Um, and Safe Expo is involved with that process. We're going to be there uh, doing the health attestations and temperature checks um, and the registration process. We did a site visit last week with Sean, so I got to meet him. Um, and it was a great, uh, you know, a, a, a great space. And I'm looking forward to, you know, that event. Um, Dave, are you seeing any meeting planners um, who are more at ease because of the space? Um, the amount of space that you have um, at Navy Pier, some of your other venues, in terms of allowing them to uh, spread out? Well, you know, I think uh, Amy hit it on the head, and, and uh, I must say I've never met her, but I love the answers she had as it relates to, you know, what her priorities are, you know, the flexibility in, in which we absolutely are, and uh, uh, working with the clients, but uh, as it relates to, uh, that yeah the um you know i think um i think first time meeting planners uh especially maybe last fall when they were just coming out of the woodwork they just didn't know what to do um there there was so much noise out there about you know good and bad to do an event or not and then everybody's saying well this is how you do it this is how you do it every state as you said before matt you know has had different restrictions and they still do today uh, so I think, you know, what, what we've tried to do, and especially with Navy Pier and we'll be doing, is making sure that, that we instill the confidence uh, right up front. Um, so we're starting to see meeting planners come out, and as soon as they see, again, to Amy's point, what we've done aggressively to prepare for them to do events, it, it kind of brings them a little bit more at ease. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, everybody has to do their first event. So... You know, what I've seen here and what I've seen in a lot of our venues that are operating is some of our venues have done multiple events with the same client. So what we've seen is their, their exhibitor attendance has increased, like the second event and the third event, and their attendee uh, numbers have increased, second event, third event, fourth event. And it's really just they, they've come out and they're like, hey, you know what, it really is safe to do things. So, uh, you know, I know uh, Tim, we've spent a bunch of time with Tim and Dylan preparing for their event in June. I think it's an amazing plan and I think we'll be ready to go and everybody will see safe. But I think the meeting planners, um, it, they're starting to come out there, but until they kind of see it in person, that, that's when it's really gonna click. And I think then they'll feel more at home 
uh, at least with the people that I know that are doing it the right way. Yeah, that's great. And I think we have a video on uh, Navy Pier, so let's run that now. Great. So Amy, as an event planner responsible for producing safe events in a post-COVID world, is a venue with the GBAC certification or something similar, something that you're looking at as more favorable? Um, if so, why? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I would go so far as to say it's a make or break necessarily, um, but it is absolutely um, more favorable. And I think that Dave's word of confidence is that's the reason. Um, like any certification, you know that the certified body has been through the education necessary to receive that certification. And in this particular instance, it's focused 100% on making sure that we are going back to gathering in a safe environment, um, so definitely. Yeah, and I know one of the previous uh, webinars that we did with um, HTS was uh, with GBAC, so that was early on, and I know they've been um, you know, great in terms of getting in and getting groups uh, and facilities um, certified. Uh, so the next question I'm gonna open up for both of you. Um, for your next person event, can you tell us a little bit of what you guys um, are doing in terms of highlighting the importance of the health and safety measures. Um, that could vary from venue to venue, um, and it maybe even go into the waivers or any kind of consent um, that you're requiring or that you're asking you know, the client to require um, in order to you know, have the event there. So I'll start with you, Dave. You know, I, I think I go back to the word collaboration um, we uh we require all of our clients to uh, create a client preparedness plan so uh, what we did uh, as spectra as a company is our corporate office uh, leadership worked with our field leadership and we created a opening plan template so we got that out to all of our facilities you know last fall uh, so all of our facilities could create opening plans that we could give to planners like amy and say, okay, here's, here's everything we're doing and here's our expectations. Uh, but, but we've also taken it one step further is we've asked for client preparedness plans from our clients. So we, we want people like Amy to tell us and present to us, what are you going to do to keep your attendees safe during the event? Now, some clients have never done a plan before. So they look at us and go, what the heck do you want? So we actually work with them and, and we, what we have for our opening plan and we work so they create a plan and it's something they distribute to their attendees. So it's really a collaborative effort to make sure up front that we're both doing everything we can to make sure the event is safe. So, you know, from a legal perspective, we work through, you know, waiver stuff and things like that. But to me, it really hasn't been a big issue. It's really been more, you know, uh, capacities, agreeing on flow, uh, agreeing on the preparedness plan as it relates to, are you doing temp checks? Um, you know, how is everything going to work as far as the event itself? And uh, I have yet to find it that hasn't really been engaging uh, to try to make that work because as Amy, I'm sure can profess, I mean, that's her livelihood. So if I'm not open and I'm not hosting events, then Amy can't do events. And so we both need each other to make sure that this happens. And, and that's what I've enjoyed about the process. Amy, same question. Uh, once again, I think Dave hit it on the head that collaboration word is critical. Um, you know, and, and it, 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 the plans are critical. And Safe Expo is doing a lot of consulting on creating these safety plans, um, particularly for the summit coming up at Navy Pier. Um, and I think that, so my first event back is going to be in California um, at the beginning of September. And then I've got four events in, you know, three countries, four states, four different cities with um, all different governing bodies, different facilities, different, di different demographics of attendees um, that you have to sort of think about and factor into your plans. So once you start with that initial plan, I think you can adapt it from an, from an event planner's perspective to each event that you're having and 
work with your city partners and your venue partners to understand the guidelines that are in place in each city and each venue, but even more, know your attendees. Um, you have to know your demographic of attendees. You need to know who's coming in the building, and those attendees need to understand what to expect when they get there. Yeah, I think you, you nailed it in terms of communication. I think you want to over-communicate. You know, what you're expecting of them in advance, you want to make sure that they're you know, well aware of that. Um, Dave, so obviously we know that uh, Hospitality Tourism Summit is going to be at Navy Pier on June 8th. Um, would you be able to share a recent example of safe meeting that took place in Palm Beach? I know we were together back in January during the PCMA uh, convening leaders uh, networking partnership that you guys did. Um, what else has taken place there at uh, the Palm Beach Conven Convention Center since then? You know, I can, Matt, I can probably give you more of a, an aerial view of uh, not only my building, but, uh, you know, Miami Beach, uh, Dallas, uh, St. Charles, Niagara Falls, Santa Clara. Um, you know, what, what we're seeing is uh, initially the, the initial return was sporting events. Uh, so really sports has led the way uh, nationwide, not only, not only outside, but really inside uh, with events. So volleyball, uh, basketball, just any indoor sports. We've done gymnastics, cheer competitions, um, and not only with us, but I mean, I'm, we're seeing them across the, the board at all of our facilities. And of course, volleyball will be coming to uh, Navy Pier in June as well. Uh, so that was really the, the impetus of, of the events kind of coming back. Um, we're doing a, a lot of small meetings. We're starting to see uh, social gathering, gatherings come back. We're starting to see dinner events come back. Uh, you know, larger dinner events, you know, in the hundreds versus, you know, 10 or 20 or 30. Um, and we're starting to see meetings come back uh, that are, you know, probably, you know, 500 to 600 person meetings that are doing breakouts, maybe one day events. But starting probably in June across the board within our facilities, we're going to start to see multi-day uh, meeting events that are what I call high impact. So basically, a lot of revenue to the building, a lot of room nights to the hotels, and then a lot of in economic impact to the community. So it's it's really kind of starting to to get to that point. Um, I don't think we'll a really large return to, to big group business until we get into 22, uh, but we do have some good business on hold throughout our company you know, for fall this year. So hopefully it'll stick. I think, as Amy said before, one of the things she brought up was uh, IT and hy hybrid. You know, I, I, my hope is hybrid doesn't take over because uh, in-person meetings are really the way it needs to be. But I think there's a there's a place for hybrid and, and our facilities are making a plan for that because, you know, I'm sure Amy is going to have a, a certain percent of our delegation or attendees that are going to be there. But there's going to be a certain percent that don't want to be there, but they still want to be attached to the event. So, you know, we're making it a point to make sure to have, have a hybrid solution in our facilities. So if there is event that wants to come in and beam in to be able to take in the event we want to make sure to be able to have the bandwidth and the equipment to make it happen and and we don't want to bankrupt Amy with the cost of actually doing that because it's not cheap to do so you know there's a lot of things that have happened with cares act lately for facilities that get down to our level where we're actually being able to you know bring in those things permanently and turnkey so you know I think I think it's it's small to mid range B right now uh, that everybody's doing a great job on, but I'll st I think we'll start to see the larger stuff coming in in fall of this year. Uh, yeah, that's great. I like I love the part of the economic impact because I think we're some people focus too much on the conventions and the trade shows and the big events, but we also have to focus on the restaurants and the hotels, like you said. Because all of that, we, I don't think people that are in the industry really understand how impactful these meetings and events are for a city. Um, and as you know, these events come back in, that's going to generate more staffing needs in restaurants and hotels. And that's going to generate more uh, Uber drivers, taxi drivers, and all of that really plays a huge impact on the success of you know, any city. Um, and I think understanding the big picture um, of the health and safety aspect um, and knowing that, that 
everything changes based on where you go. And so it's really important to have a good understanding of the city that you're going to, the venue that you're going to, um, you know, and what those health and safety protocols are. Um, so I'll, I'll end it with this one question um, in terms of how both of you are managing the increase of staffing, um, either in your facility or in your organization, or how you're preparing, um, you know, for the event and all of the things that are centered around the event while also being responsible and maintaining a budget for Amy and obviously for staffing needs um, for your facility. So I'll start that question for Amy. Yeah, um, it, 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 it's, it's been a challenge, but it's also been a great learning experience and a different way of doing things for sure. Um, I will say that, you know, I, Matt, you and I started working together in, back in October for an event that's taking place citywide in Boston in 2022 um, on a site visit. And, and that just shows you've got to start this planning early. You have to start these conversations early. At the time, we were the first site visit to go into Boston, mm -hmm. um, back um, into the city. Um, and we kind of all felt our way through that together. Um, so we came out of that site visit with a pretty comprehensive understanding of what what our space was going to look like, what the facility could do to help us, what we as event organizers were going to have to take on. Um, and the CVB was involved with that as well, going back to the economic impact. You have to understand what restaurant guidelines are, what hotel guidelines are, how you're going to get from the airport, what happens when you return to the airport. So many, so many things go into planning these, these events that we produce. Um, and I would say um, from a budget perspective, which is, a, it's, it's my version of um, Dave's buffet word. I, <laughs> it's kind of, it gives me a little tinge. But from a budget perspective, you need, you really have to involve your key stakeholders from a very, from very early on in the process. Um, you know, you, you, us as event organizers in particular, we might be used to just developing a budget um, year over year and just doing it. And everybody trusts that we know what we're talking about and that our venue partners know what we talking, what we're talking about. And you got the right quotes, but when you're presenting a budget now going into 2021 and 2022 that is substantially higher on the expense side and substantially lower on the revenue side, everybody needs to understand why and everybody needs to understand what that means. Um, so by involving your executive leadership, your boards, your venue partners, anybody that's involved, the key stakeholders in that budgeting process early, um, you'll have a lot easier time, I think, um, getting, getting things through. Yeah. Uh, Dave, same question uh, to you. Yeah, I think uh, probably the most important thing first off is, uh, you know, from a company standpoint, I mean, any Spectra managed venue, we've, we, we're going to do it right. You know, we're, we're, uh, we understand that there's a cost of doing business. We understand that it's going to cost us more. We understand that it'll cut into to, to the profit line, but, but we've got to do it right. And, uh, and that's what we've been doing. So, um, so that's number one. I think uh, number two, is um, it's respecting that we're all in the same boat. Um, you know, we, uh, um, we, we all are both, as Amy just said, you know, we're all incurring more expense and you are too sure, I'm sure Matt, you know, uh, as well. Um, so we, we really, and I'll use the word one last time, we, we really look at it as a collaborative situation. Um, so it's it's uh, you know there 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 could be certain costs that may be passed on, but but also it's really a case by case basis. We really that as a team uh, because I already know that Amy's if this is if I was hosting Amy's first event, I already know that Amy may have 500 people or may have a thousand or may have 200. So it's it's really hit or miss. So from a facility standpoint, we need to be hand in hand with her. We need to make sure that if she takes it on the chin you know, we're there as a company to support her because she's the one taking the risk to come out and do her event. Uh, you know, eventually it'll be kind of like back to normal or at least she'll be confident of what she's going to turn out. But I think that, uh, you know, we, we realize, uh, you know, what uh, what the expense is, but we're, we're just working with our clients. And the good news is most of our municipalities uh, that, uh, that we manage their facilities on their behalf are completely understanding it of, of it as well. And I would use Navy Pier as a great example. They have been, uh, we've only been managing since uh, a year ago, uh, the venue, but such a great partner through the pandemic. And they know that, you know, whatever we need to do to get open and do it right. 
and it's not there isn't a discussion about well you know uh, everything's got to be passed on it's like let's let's get the clients in here and let's work together and eventually we'll get into a groove and then we'll know where it all sits yeah that's yeah that's very important and i think um you know as amy was talking about budgets health and safety was not typically a budget line item and so now it is and it's very important for everyone to understand that you know it it does it is going to cost a little bit of money um to provide the you know the safe space um for people to come back and meet safely um and i think this entire conversation kind of it centers around that and the whole goal of safe expo and everyone in the industry is really to return um, to live meetings and events. So uh, I thank you guys very much for being part of um, this session. And I thank uh, Hospitality Turis Tourism Summit um, and uh, Tim and Dylan. And we're going to pass it on to you guys. Thank you very much. Okay, you can't leave yet. <laughs> I have to thank you for doing such a wonderful job with this. Um, our event is going to be much better for working with you guys. I hope everyone out there appreciates uh, the insight on how to keep your employees and your guests safe. Very important these days, and I know we're taking it very importantly. Dave in Florida and his team at Navy Pier are helping us to do that as well. So we have uh, Garrett popcorn for everyone. Dave, yours might be a little stale by the time you get back to Chicago. <laughs> I <laughs> love have a Garrett. Kid for you. Yes. Uh, but seriously, I wanted to thank you guys. It's so important doing what you're doing, and it's so important for our industry. I know, you know, Dylan and our team at Atima have been working hard with your team to make sure we have a plan, as well as with the Spectra and Navy Pier teams and, and Levy, uh, our partners at Navy Pier for the event. So um, on behalf of um, my teammates at Atima, please uh, take the popcorn with you when you leave, because we're going to eat too much of it if you don't. <laughs> Um, but if you're watching this on May 25th and you have any more questions, our panelists will be around until noon to answer them. And if you're watching this after May 25th as a recording on Expo, you can see the questions and answers uh, that were posted today in the feed on the page. So, um, but I hate to tell you, you won't be able to ask questions. You'll just be able to see the ones uh, Q&A from before. Before I let you get back to Q&A, please join us at 1 p.m. today for a great educational session entitled How to Tackle Hybrid Events in the Virtual Divide. It's brought to you by Andrew Burrode from AV Chicago. And finally, I look forward to seeing you at Navy Pier on June 8th. Now, please submit any last-minute questions to our gracious panelists, and I will get out of your hair. Thank you. <laughs>